Hey, welcome to uh, the LSE Library's Reading Room. Um, my name is Indy Buller and I'm a curator in the library and I'm the host for today's In Conversation session. So the idea behind the sessions is we speak to a researcher who's used our library's special collections of the archives and take a little look at what they found in terms of their research but also revisit some of the original materials and the documents that they used in the course of their research and hopefully uncover some of the stories uh, from it. So today I'm joined by uh, Dr. Jim Mower, and you'll be helping us do that uh, al al alongside me. Uh, Jim is an historian and biographer whose new book, Walter Citrine, The Forgotten Statesman of the Trades Union Congress, got a copy of it right here, um, is based on his research at the LSE, which took place over the 10 years or so. Jim was a full-time union official and he obtained his doctorate in 1989 from his part-time studies at the University of London. He was born and raised in Ireland and he holds a law degree from University College Cork but he's lived in London since the 1960s. So thank you very much Jim for joining us today. Please Welcome. do. I only knew of him as do most people today from his work called the ABC of Chairmanship which was a little tome which started as notes for his electrician members in Liverpool, yeah. but which was developed into a booklet based on uh, parliamentary procedures because, of course, meetings are the lifeblood mm. of trade union people. And so many of them were quite rowdy and disorderly. And so he, he sat down, and this was his style, rather than moan about it, he would actually say, Let's, how can we... How can we guide people to actually do things properly? Mm -hmm. And so his book is today referred to as Citrine, as the Bible. Some of these diaries that we brought out are from his times abroad. And this first set here, the yellow set, these are some uh, diaries that he wrote from his time as part of something called the Moyne Commission when he travelled to the uh, British West Indies, I think it was called then, uh, in the late 1930s. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about the Moyne Commission? And yes, uh, I think this is one of Citrine's greatest achievements. In uh, 1937, there were riots in Trinidad, Jamaica, all over the Caribbean because of the appalling conditions in which people were living. The planters were still in control. The employers there had no regard for the housing conditions or other sanitary conditions of the people. And so the Mine Commission was set up as a royal commission. Lord Moyne was, in fact, a member of the Guinness family. And they all went out. Citrine, in fact, got himself on it as a result of his knowledge of Malcolm MacDonald, who was the minister, Ramsay MacDonald's son, in the national government. So he... The, the TUC were already very conscious of this and very anxious to influence the government here to do something about conditions in, in the Caribbean. So they went to all the islands. And, and this, this map, I think, really gives you a visual, a beautiful, beautiful map. Mm, it's very of, detailed. And, and with his, with his um, arrowed journey, yes. the, the actual the, 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 the route they took almost, yeah. from yeah. Jamaica round Cuba, down to Dominica, and over to the smaller islands, all of which they visited. But what was distinctive about Citrine's visit was that he was outraged and indignant at the conditions he met. And he, he said, look, I'm ashamed to, to be an Englishman, to coming here in the name of the empire, treating these people in this way. And so he, he, he didn't just express outrage, he decided to do something about it. So he got in touch with the local union leaders who were regarded as rebels and regarded as communists and agitators. And he said, no, no, I'm going to meet them and talk. And he went into lots of their homes. And he said, look, you've got to do it this way. And he coached them on giving evidence to the Royal Commission. He then went to Lord Mine and had up and down us to actually persuade the Commission that they should recommend a radical solution, which they did. And it came back to London in 1939, 1940, 
nothing happened because of the war. But right. he persuaded the, the coalition government to, to commit to implementing the radical re recommendations in 1945. Um, it's, it's interesting in that the diaries themselves are almost like you've got pictures of the ships that they travelled on uh, out there. They're kind of almost uh, a busman's holiday. You know, well, Citroen kind of, was like that. Yeah. He kept photos of ships' menus right, yeah. at the captain's table. Yeah. You know, anything to give a, a practical implementation. Uh, and he obviously had a very simple camera, but yeah. he, got some decent, he got some decent pictures. It's during the war, then, in about 1940, that he travels to the USA and to America for, for another sort of tour. And he, again, he kept Sorry. a very meticulous uh, diary of his time out in the States. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about why he went over to yes. these? Uh, and so the general counsel, his boss, said, look, you'd better go because I think there's an important message to be given to the American unions because the American unions were notoriously isolationist. They didn't want to know about the war in Europe. Well, Citrine, uh, before he went, he went to Churchill and he said, look, I don't really want to go here. I haven't got the time, and it's a long ways and all that. But if you if you think I can do some use, give me some use, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll go. And, and uh, he went back to his own council, and they said, "Look, you're going." So he he went. It was in New Orleans. He travelled there, and he's he's left a wonderful map again of his itinerary uh, across from New York to New Orleans, and it was tough that, look, it will be a matter of time before Britain surrenders. France is gone, Belgium, Holland, and all the rest. It really will be a matter of time. And they were expecting in America that Hitler would be in London. And it was that, and the fighting spirit of the British <clears throat> at the time, he, he tried to convey. He said, we're not going. We're not, we're not surrendering. We, we are going on. Mm -hmm. But this time he he was quite emotional and he conveyed the feeling of what was happening and the, 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 some of the reports from the newspapers in America said that he had brought tears to the mm -hmm. eyes of some of the delegates yeah and Roosevelt read it and he said yeah I want to see this guy and so he he after he, he traveled to Canada and around and back he called in to see President. The president, and they had a very good rapport. They they really did uh, get on extremely well, and as a result, they had a close contact throughout the war. So we were just talking there about um, the time that Citrine spent in in North America during his speaking tour, uh, the, the kind of almost the height of uh, the Second World War. Uh, and he met with Roosevelt, but he also had uh, quite a close connection with uh, with with another wartime leader in Winston Churchill. There's a, in fact, there's a whole strand of um, Citrine's papers which is called Eminent Contemporaries, where he kind of mentions people like Churchill and and the Webbs and and various other uh, people who he, who he met and had close connections with. Um, but let's start off by talking about Churchill. Um, because he had a fairly long-standing relationship with, uh, with him, didn't he? Very much so. Starting with the general strike. Because, mm. of course, Churchill was the minister, uh, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer. And he was violently opposed to the general strike and regarded as an attack on the state and, and so on. So um, they, they, they didn't get on at that point, mm. clearly. Citrine was the, the officer, a secretary to the negotiating committee. So they had lots of meetings at Downing Street mainly with the Prime Minister Baldwin, but also Churchill came into the picture quite a lot, including precipitating the strike, because he, he ran into the, the, the cabinet and said, look, the printers won't print the Daily Mail. <laughs> <laughs> Balloon goes up, you know, and, and they said, and then they pulled out their state of emergency, which the king had already signed, and they said, look, away we go. Citrine sort of came he became head of the TUC yes. just as the general strike was, was Absolutely. about to start, didn't he? It was quite a baptism of fire to be... Baptism of fire, but also fate. 
he was the number two responsible for admin stuff. His boss dies when he's in Moscow. He's called back and tossed into the cauldron, the general strike. And really that did shape his career. After the strike, he set about um, changing the whole union approach and it would be more cooperative, less confrontational. Mm -hmm. And the, he arranged um, get-togethers with large employers. They called it the Mond-Turner Talks. Alfred Mond, who was chairman of ICI, plus 40 other big employers. Ben Turner, who was president of the TUC. But Citrine was the man behind it. Yeah. And it was very successful. They, amazingly, they, they agreed with lots of things. And they talked about recognising trade unions, collective bargaining, mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, it didn't succeed because of the Great Depression. All bets were off in 1929 onwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though you had a Labour government, yeah. huge unemployment, and therefore the TUC and unions were quite weak until the 1930s. We have a clipping actually from that year, from 1929, and again with, with reference to Churchill, these mm. folders that we're looking at are particularly about his, his uh, notes and details from meetings he had with Churchill, press cuttings, and it's, as you said, their combative relationship is, is expressed quite well. The clippings from uh, the election campaign, I think, for, so from about 17th of May 1929, and the headline is, Mr. Citrine slates Churchill. Uh, and he, it says, the sub-headline says, gross distortion uh, about national strike. So this is where Citrine is in fact defending um, uh, some that? of the Labour leaders who uh, Churchill was trying to impugn by saying, well, they were behind the general strike. Um, and he's trying to... Of course, the TUC were convinced that when Churchill was Chancellor of the Exchequer, by putting Britain back on the gold standard, that it made coal exports particularly uncompetitive. But obviously their relationship improved as the years went on? Yes, and, and for one reason particularly, um, they were both on the same tune in terms of anti-fascism. Um, Citrine, as I said, was president of the International Federation of Trade Union, which, whose executive met in Berlin from 1931 to 1933. So they, they were there as, as the Nazis took over. And in fact, they had to leave themselves because they were being pressurized and, and threatened with arrest mm -hmm. and, and what have you. So Citrine was alive to this danger. Mm -hmm. He came back to London, he came back to, Bre to Blackpool and he gave a major speech to um, warn the British people and the British workers, look, this is what's happening, this is what's coming down. He actually had very close relations with a Jewish, New York Jewish organization who had printed his speech verbatim and took him round because they were more sensitive to the danger of Hitler than anybody. Mm. A lot of the Americans weren't. Mm. And so they set up the anti-fascist council focus group he became, both in New York and in London. And Churchill regularly graced their platforms. Citrine chaired the meetings. Yeah. They, they had big meetings at the Albert Hall. And they were, they were sort of very important, a very important influence. Well, that's, uh, we have one of those um, meetings here. We've got the uh, speech that I think Citrine gave at uh, right. that's an event called um, a report of the meeting held at the Royal Albert Hall under the auspices of the League of Nations Union in the in the That's defense of peace. Yes. Yeah. In the defense of peace and freedom. And that's from nineteen thirty six. Thirty six, yeah. And Citrine as it says there is the is the chairman. That's He's right. kind of leading the event, holding right. everything together. But you've got other speakers, Lady Violet Bonham That's Carter. Right. Who and, was Asquith's daughter. Yeah. And then um, the right honourable Winston, Winston Churchill. That's right. Um, Churchill's speech got some degree yes. of notoriety yes. as well and, and, and fame afterwards, yes. but Citrine, I think, gave the 
But you can imagine the interplay between them because mm. they they would have discussed it, mm. and then they would Sitting would have been able to give a first-hand account of what was happening on the continent because he had intelligence from the other unions in Holland, Belgium, France, who were all involved in his international committee. Mm. So these are all senior people yeah. who have been through uh, the First World War and onwards yeah. in, in Europe. And so he, he, was, he, was, he was a big wheel. Yeah, indeed. So there's another connection as well to another couple of uh, eminent contemporaries uh, that uh, Citrine also knew and, and, and had some kind of relationship with, uh, and that is Sidney and Beatrice Webb. Obviously, the Webbs uh, were kind of precursors almost to, to uh, Citrine in terms of their writing on Russia, and obviously they did, they, they, um, did a large-scale study in history of trade unionism, which I think Citrine Absolutely. Uh, had read and, and uh, really Swore appreciated. By. Yeah. Yeah. Um, needless to say, there's a very close connection to the Webbs and, uh, and LSE, uh, the co-founders of the school. Yes. Uh, one of our uh, sort of <clears throat> most prized possessions, I suppose, in the archives of their diaries, and well, the archives in general of the, of the Webbs, and we've got the diaries of Beatrice Webb, and I believe she mentions in, in her diaries the uh, meeting that she had with uh, Walter, and how did they meet? And what was well, that? She makes a lot of references to Citrine actually. She thought, she thought originally uh, he was a Bolshevik. Right. She thought he had communistic tendencies. When Citrine went to see them, they arrowed, they argued uh, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. and, and she had, she, she was quite taken with him you know, okay. at this point. She, 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 she said he was the first intellectual that he, trade unions have ever had. He clearly had, uh, and she did a what was really a, a, a portrait of him. Yeah, and you've included it. Very much book. a caricature of him. So I'll just read you a little bit. Um, Beatrice described Citrine as an intellectual of the scientific type, caught up in a syndicalistic and guild socialist inspired drama. After describing his personal characteristics as a hygienic Puritan in his daily life, cold baths and all that stuff, with the manners and clothes and way of speaking of a superior bank clerk. She opined that Citrine's pitfall, this is quote from her, will be personal vanity and the sort of conceit which arises from continuous association with uneducated and unself-controlled official superiors. When Margaret Cole edited Beatrice's diary, Beatrice, uh, diaries, she asked Citrine's permission to include this extract, you know, because clearly it was libelous, or could it could have been uh, from our point of view. He said, "No, no don't worry about it. it, it it's what she said. It's it's wrong." He said, "You know, it, it's, it's not what I said. It's not what I thought, but it, it, it's it's what she said, what she said. And, it, and 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 therefore he he gave his agreement. Now that's that's quite a a broad-minded." Sure thing to do. Uh, and clearly he, he was quite amused. Post-war though, he, he then uh, finds himself with a role uh, which has been given to him by uh, the Attlee administration, was that right? Well yes, he, he, was, he was offered a position, first of all on the National Coal Board, uh, and secondly in the uh, Central Electricity Authority both being just about to be nationalised. Um, and it was the Atlee administration. Um, but he'd, he'd more or less um, retired early mm. from the TUC because of he was disappointed by what they'd done for them at the unions. Okay. But he'd, he, it was really, uh, I suppose, a great opportunity. He saw it as a second career electrician. Mm becoming chair of the Electricity Council. Because he started his he union had, life almost. As an electrician. Yeah. And his first um, thought in where he came from, in Wallasey, he was wiring houses of the wealthy, because the rest didn't have electricity. Yeah. And he vowed that he and, and his members and the people would have electricity. Yeah. And here he is uh, 40 years later, 
and charge and he actually helped bring about the electrification of rural England and rural Wales and rural Scotland and rural Ireland, wow. Northern Ireland, because they didn't have electricity, they had it in the cities by that time. So it was a romance and many Shinwell who offered him the job, the Minister for Fuel and Power, he said it was, it was, it was a romance because this symbolised the workers taking over the industries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tent, there was a threat of a strike, was there, right, yes. at the start of his tenure? Well, it, it was a little bit further on. No. The strikes were a problem, um, in London particularly, and South Wales. And they, these were unofficial strikes. And so um, the minister wanted to crash down on them. But he said, no, let's deal with this more cleverly and that they had negotiations. They also involved the official unions, electricians union, engineering union, transport in general, and they actually settled these disputes. Yeah. So he, he, had, he brought that skill mm -hmm. to Definitely. bear. Also that understanding of working people. He, he didn't see people just because they were militant and angry. He didn't sort of see them as communists and you know as people who were troublemakers. They may be they may have been some troublemakers, but he always thought, what's the problem? Mm -hmm. Why are people so upset? And he would generally find a way. Yeah. He had a good team again. That was one of his secrets in life. He always built up a team at the TUC and at the Electricity Council of key people mm -hmm. with skills and with temperament to work together. Yeah. Indeed. Really, he, he was overshadowed by his colleague, Ernest Bevin, who became Foreign Secretary, who was Minister of uh, uh, Social Insurance, uh, Minister of Labour and uh, Social Insurance. Because Bevin was, of course, the, 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 the embodiment of, of the working class, manual working class image, and Churchill uh, and Attlee both boosted him mm. tremendously. So he's got six biographies. Or more. This is the first about Citrine's had. Right. Why? Again, A, he left the industry, he left the TUC in 46, so he, he was out of the fray. But also, he, throughout his life, he was involved in controversy with the communists from the 1920s. And they were very bitter because he, he'd succeeded in isolating them. What had happened in Europe? hadn't happened in Britain. And so they took every opportunity to belittle him or ignore, distort his, his message. Bevan used to sneer that Citrine's got files and Michael Foote also, his, his protege, adopted that, that slogan. But it was, it was a sneer because it, it was a put down mm -hmm. to suggest that he was a bureaucrat that he was a backroom person and that he didn't have any real... And he said this, mm -hmm. Bevan said this, he was a colourless personality. Why would the unions listen to him? But when you think of his career, his background in the electrical industry as a union official, as a district official, mm -hmm. as a national official, involved in all the negotiations, all the mainstream union stuff, when he came to the TUC he was aged 38 so he had quite a experience, mm. and it showed. So it was a, it was a complete distortion. It's really interesting. Well, you've corrected the record, I'm sure, with your with your book and your biography, hopefully, which is available in all good bookshops. We should add. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Jim. It's been an absolute pleasure. No, it's, a, it's been a pleasure, and thank you also to the LSE for the access and facilities that you've given me over the years, because I've been doing this part-time and coming backwards and forwards and I've had a lot of help from the librarians and the archivists and so no if you could pass on my thanks oh, to them. Well indeed.